Okay, has anybody got any questions before we start? When is your video project due? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night by 11.59. So, um, any further questions on that? What's, what's my number one rule with that? <clears throat> be funny and creative. So be creative and have fun. That's the main thing. Economics can be really fun. All right. So, um, got a few different videos we're going to do today. So pull out a sheet of paper. You'll be turning this in for credit again. So we mentioned occupational licensing. Um, so we're going to look at a couple different videos related to that. I got to go. Let me get my markers. So we're going to start with this one. Or you want to start your own business? Pull yourself out of poverty. But well, watch out, because government may not make it easy. Just ask this woman who's good at braiding hair. Ten years ago, she moved from Africa to Utah. She assumed she could support her two kids by using the hair braiding skills she learned in Africa. And she did for four years. Did this in her home and made decent money. But then, the government shut her down because, as this video from the Institute for Justice explains, she didn't have an expensive and useless cosmetology license. That license requires at least 2,000 hours of classroom instruction. That's 40 hours a week for 50 weeks. That is more class hours than it takes to be an armed security guard, mortgage loan originator, real estate sales agent, EMT, and lawyer combined. And not one of those 2,000 hours teaches African hair braiding. Hair braider Justina Clayton joins us now from Utah, along with Paul Avalar, her lawyer from the Institute for Justice, which took her case for free. Paul, the license costs thousands of dollars for a class that's useless, really? That's correct. Uh, in all those 2,000 hours, they don't spend any time teaching you how to break. So why do they pass a rule like that? Well, what happened was that the state just passed a really broad law and left it to the, the cosmetology board to, to, to interpret it and enforce it. And the cosmetology board is made up entirely of cosmetologists who don't like competition. So they get to work with government to keep competition out. And Justina, you, you were doing this for four years, and then you think another a competitor complained? Yes, I actually got an email. Um, the email threatened to um, report me to the licensing division if I continue to braid. But you'd already and gone so, to the licensing commission, and they said, oh, hair braiding is OK. Yes, but the cosmetology lady told me that the situation had changed and that I needed to go to school now and get a license. Maybe the situation so, changed because your competitors complained. And the school really doesn't teach hair braiding, but you'd have to go anyway? Yes, I called about six schools um, along the West Side Front and they um, told me that they don't teach braiding and that I needed to, if I want to specialize in braiding, I would have to get independent help with that. So they also told you if you want to work, you have to go to the legislature and get them to pass a law to allow you to do this. And you started yes. to do that. Yes. They told you that if you kept braiding, went back into business, you'd be fined 2,000 bucks a day? Well, the first offense is $1,000. The second oh, offense and any subsequent offense is $2,000. So, Each day. Paul, I mean, this is nuts, and this is not unique to Utah, right? It is not unique to Utah. There are about 10 states that require, explicitly require people to go get this expensive, useless license to braid hair. Um, and about half of the states don't have a rule. They, like Utah, just leave it to the cosmetologist to decide whether or not they want to be competed with. And states always create these licensing board and boards, and licensing sounds good to people. They don't realize they get captured by the established business. Absolutely. And when we called them, they said, we don't make the laws, we just enforce them. <laughs> um, but you've gotten these laws overturned. You're seven for seven at the Institute for Justice. That's right. We've They're sued. not overturned, but they give up when you that's, call. Yeah, that's right. In seven states, we've sued about this very same issue. Uh, California fought us, and we beat them in court, and every other state and the District of Columbia has just given up the fight. And Justina, one, one of the people, one of the cosmetologists said, if you don't get a license and you don't go to school braiding people's hair, you might make them bald. <laughs> 
Um, no, braiding, braiding is you know completely safe. It is reversible, so so no, it doesn't hurt. It's not harmful. But the government wants to stop you, and it used to be that one in twenty workers needed government permission to do their occupation. Today, it's one in three. They keep passing more of these rules. That's right, and occupational licensing laws fall hardest on minorities, on poor, on elderly workers who want to start a new career or change careers. They, they just help entrenched industries and businesses keep out competition. Thank you, Paul Avalar of the Institute for Justice and Justina Clayton. Good luck to you. I hope you can go back to Brady. This is a full three months of food. Okay, go ahead and write down your reflection. Give you a minute here. Do you So for those of you who are just uh, done here, we some people are wrapping up. What is the characteristic that's kind of being, um, oh, violated in a sense by occupational licensing? So we had those three characteristics. We did it with perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition, oligopoly. We kind of always did those three characteristics. Which one is occupational licensing? A barrier. A barrier, good justice, right? So a barrier to entry this is creating a barrier for other people to uh, compete on. So um, let's see, Justice, give me a number between three and eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Did I do it this way? Yeah, Kennedy, what did you have to say? That keep out competition, occupational licensing, okay. What about safety? You kind of heard it say that, oh, you, uh, you know, I don't know if they were joking or not, but you might cause people to go bald, for crying out loud. Uh, what about safety? I mean, is there a good argument there to say that, no, we need you to be licensed uh, to keep the consumer safe? Um, you know, what, where are some elements of cosmetology, those who do go to cosmetology school, um, what are some safety concerns that we might have with consumers getting, uh, going to a salon and getting some sort of hair treatment or otherwise? What are some possible things? Go ahead. Using the right equipment. Using the right equipment, okay. And I don't know if you got an example of it or what would be the, what would be unsafe equipment, I guess, if you're thinking equipment. Okay. There could be something there, but I want a little more details. Javian? Say that again? Chemicals. chemicals, yeah. I think the chemicals in the hair, if you're getting your hair colored or a perm or something, maybe there's something there um, for having some safety uh, concerns. Anything else you can think of? I mean, cutting people with the scissors? Is there anything that's life-threatening? most likely that you could dream up at a, at a salon? Is there anything life threatening? So my question to you <clears throat> is how does the free market discipline careless stylists that cut or burn with chemicals or use the wrong equipment? How does the market, the free market with it, suppose there's no government involved with, with the salon business, <clears throat> how does the free market discipline Bad stylists. They lose business. They lose business, right? So as long as it's not life-threatening, you go there and you get a bad hair coloring and they burn a little bit of skin here and it's a little irritated for two days. You go there and they snip your ear 
and it's not cut off. I saw that look. It's not cut off, it's just a little cut. And, you know, do, by the way, do you get cut by those who are licensed some, once in a while? Has anybody been nipped in the ear? Sure, it's just part of it happening, right? But you live, and it heals, and you move on. So the big thing is, do we really need the government um, having 2,000, I believe it was 1,600 hours in Kansas, we talked about that before, yeah. you know, in something like the salon business? Um, you know, if, <clears throat> what about uh, lice? That's kind of gross. My son, when he was five years old, got lice, and that stuff's nasty. I might have been early. I think it was five years old. Um, you know, if they're not putting the comb into the proper solution or something, uh, are you going to die from lice? Will you complain about them on social media a little bit if you got lice at a salon? Would that salon lose business? Yeah, right? So again, the market has a way of correcting itself through those salons wanting to maximize profits. So how did occupational licensing actually begin in the first place, most likely? Who started occupational licensing, most likely? They might not have said this exactly in the, film, in the recording. I can't remember. I had to step out for a little bit. What's that? The big companies? What kind of companies? Who? Started occupational licensing via figure. And what do you mean by big companies? Like, big companies that get the most. And when I say, I, I mean, I, and I should be more specific, I'm talking about salon occupational licensing. Who do you think started that? The cosmetology people, right? Those who wanted to protect their own business. They're like, oh, we've got these competitors. Uh, doing this or that, and they're not as good as us, you know, we do the best hair colorings, we should have uh, rules in place. So what do they do? They go to their politician and they say, hey, we need a law to protect the consumer and pass a minimum amount of standards. I, I can almost guarantee you, if we go back to 1970 or something, how many hours do you think it was required to get your cosmetology license? Well, just take a step. You guys that weren't even born yet, but about 20 hours? Maybe it's a course, 15 hours, 10 hours? I don't know. I guarantee you it wasn't 1,600 hours and $20,000 of tuition and other things, right? Not even close. So it probably started off pretty innocent is, what, is how these things usually go. Oh, congressperson. Um, in the name of safety, we just think that they should have at least 20 hours of training, learn about the chemicals, learn not how to spread lice around, learn how to not cut people's ears. You know, they can pick that up in, in 10 hours, 15 hours, whatever, you pick a number. But then, guess what happened next year when they, they established it was 20 hours? Oh, yeah, we got a lot more training to do. Oh, there's a lot of things we could do with this. Let's just make the training program 40 hours. 80 hours, 160 hours, right? Before you know it, we're in 2020 with 1,600 hours worth of work. These things tend to grow because now the barriers are getting higher protecting the existing businesses, right? And so they're all in favor of it. They got their license. In fact, better yet, they got their license when it was only required to have 20 hours worth of, of service, right? And so now they're making the new people coming into the business get the 1,000 hours of training when they got their license when it was only 20. Okay, any other last comments or questions there? <clears throat> All right, I got one more kind of similarly related here. Kind of a you have a license, you better. Government often demands licenses before you're allowed to work. People think this is a good idea. We license drivers, we license dogs. People think it makes us safer. But licensing also does something bad. If people want to work, let them work. 11-year-old Madison Root was told she could not work because she didn't have a license. She wanted money for braces, so she tried selling mistletoe. Here she is in a tree picking it. But when she went to sell it at this outdoor market, police told her, stop, that's illegal. They told her she could beg, but she can't sell anything. So her father sent us this video. I was amazed that people cannot work hard, but they can be just lazy? I assume that's not exactly what the cops meant, but the fact is, all over America, people want to work but can't because it's so hard to get proper licenses. 
In the 1950s, well, only about one in 20 Americans needed the government's blessing to do their job. Today, that number is more than one in three. This new book, Bottlenecks, reveals how licensing rules allow older businesses to profit by keeping newcomers out. These are people who want to erect barriers, who want to put in place bottlenecks because they want to keep competitors out. It's kind of like what happens on a highway if you close a lane. The established existing businesses are like these motorcycles. Licenses don't slow them down. During my consumer reporter days, I assumed licenses protected us from scams like these. Yeah, I'm not ripping people off. But licensing doesn't stop that. Georgia funeral director, who was pitching dead bodies out of the woods behind his funeral establishment. He was licensed. Bernie Madoff was licensed. Teachers in public schools who have sex with their students. License. Licensing doesn't stop that. What licensing does do is crush new entrepreneurs. Want to braid people's hair? This woman was told she couldn't do it legally unless she spent thousands of hours to get a cosmetology license. She begged the government, just let me braid. I was making these phone calls to the Board of Cosmetology saying, I don't want to do cosmetology. All I want to do is braid hair. No, not without our license, said the cosmetology board. These are people who have a clear conflict of interest. Of course they do. She wants to compete with them. Cosmetologists got together and they went to the legislature and they lobbied for the creation of a license. It makes me wonder. How could I get rid of my competition? I'm annoyed by all these TV channels. I'd like to limit that. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. So what you need to do, John, is that you need to go to the government and ask for special protection. You need to claim that there is some public interest, some way that the public is going to be protected by limiting the number of providers. And that actually happened in America. When I started in TV, most viewers just had ABC, CBS, NBC, and boring public television. People could have had many more channels. Cable TV technology was available. But lobbyists from my employer argue, no, that'll hurt poor people. They need broadcast TV. They can't afford cable. So the FCC limited cable TV for years. And that helped me make more money. It certainly does. That's the effect of licensing. That is, the people who are in the industry have the ability to artificially inflate prices and their wages as a result. Consumers are worse off. I was better off. You were much better off, but now we realize everyone else was worse off. That's what the bottleneck does. It limits choices, thereby raising prices and enriching older businesses. There are so many bottlenecks. We'll show you a bunch in the next episode. We'll also show you how these problems can be better solved by the free market. Market regulation actually is enough for the vast majority of occupations out there. Bottleneckers around America, they make life worse for you. Okay, take a minute to get that down. <clears throat> Okay, what was our number was seven justice? Is that it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's your name? Corey. Corey. Um, so licensing causes a significant inflation, so it's good for people in the business, but for consumers who are trying to the market, it's um, like high barriers that are marketed. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad you got that, that insight that there are people who benefit, right? And then there's people who get harmed. So some people, uh, the existing people are getting to their benefits. So following the incentives, that makes sense. Um, any other comments or questions on that one? All right, so we're gonna shift gears here a little bit back to um, some gender issues. Um, so your special topic area is on uh, number seven, uh, nine, rather, and I want to show you, uh, so it's got basically more details on gender. So the, the name of special topic is earning differences between men and women. And I want to show a couple things and then we got another video we'll look at. I mentioned the labor force participation rate and how that's changed and how we talked about some of the demographics that are 
changing over time. Okay, so back from, this goes back to 1960, and this is uh, female and male, uh, female male annual earnings and their ratio. So what has happened over time, <coughs> in the 80s we had female and annual earnings uh, full time uh, was on the left, and this was the uh, percent of the labor force. So on the female line, let me look on this thing a little bit closer here. Yeah, so percentage, okay, so this is percentage of women age 20 and older uh, on the right. So labor force participation uh, continued to go up and uh, earnings uh, also went up. Let's see, and then I got one other one. This one. This one kind of unpacks some of the differences uh, between uh, men and women in earnings and looks at women that were never married versus married with a spouse. And so what is the difference here in their pay when we take that into account? Why would never being married be looked at as a variable compared to being married? Okay, they don't have to leave for, for what? For like, uh, leave. Yeah, possibly for maternity leave would be one, one big thing, right? And Usually whenever you aren't married to, you only like to worry about yourself, I guess. So they would only worry about work. work. Okay. And when you're not married, you're more work-centered, right? So yeah, a little more of a work for, uh, work-centered. So you've got the household. You may or may not have kids. Um, are there trade-offs then about things to do at the house versus who makes the money when you have two people, two household earnings? So this is married with the spouse uh, present. Does that make a difference? It's certainly something to take into account, right? I, I shared with you, <clears throat> my two brothers ended up uh, spending more time at home because they were working, they had a work at home type of opportunity. So a lot of that changes and so the gap closes uh, quite a bit when we look at um, never married women versus um, married women and that so that's part of uh, the cultural stuff that we talked about yesterday <clears throat> okay so this one is one of my favorite economists it's an old video <clears throat> and he was speaking to uh, a number of people at a lecture here so Dramatic music, dramatic music. So Milton Friedman <coughs> was uh, addressing a crowd, and it was about the case of male and female work. So he takes some questions. So uh, if you want to put like on your sheet, just put like Milton Friedman if you want, and we'll take a look at this one here. Oh, lost. Are a source of apartheid. You know, the basic source of apartheid in South Africa was the insistence by trade unions on equal pay for equal work. The equal, the women who go around today urging equal pay for equal work are being anti feminist. They don't intend to be, but that is the effect of their policy. Because if there is any activity in which, for any reason, a male is preferable to a female, or vice versa. The only weapon the less productive sex has is to offer to work for less. And if you deny them that opportunity, you're assuring yourself that you're gonna have all male jobs or all female jobs or all white jobs or all black jobs. But aren't you also condemning them to stay that way? So one thing I want you to <clears throat> put down on your papers is to listen to when they come to how uh, the discriminator, the person who's sexist that prefers males over females or the racist, how they get penalized if there's not government intervention. So kind of pay attention to that. We've been talking about that a little bit with uh, how does the market system penalize uh, bad behavior. So that's what, uh, pay attention to that when we get to that part here. I want to make sure we're not going too fast. Okay, good. Not at all. Not at all. The typical course, if you go back to American history, by 
are taking these low paid jobs? A great many people, not all, but a great many people were able to develop skills and activities, accumulate a little skill, a little capital, a little knowledge, improve their life, become a, a advance in the stage, get to a higher level of productivity, and get a higher income. That's been the typical way up the ladder for most of the people who came in. It was the way up the ladder for my parents, for your parents, or grandparents, or great grandparents, I don't know. Wage. And that's the way in which, unfortunately, there's no way in which you can immediately propel people to the top of the ladder. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Friedman, referring to the statements that you made about women who after paid equal pay for equal work. Gee, I thought I'd better rise out of that. Uh, uh, Delighted to have it. Um, yes, okay, I just would like to know if you're insinuating or perhaps, you know, point blankly saying that um, women and other minority skills are inferior to those of those now holding those jobs and that they need to go through a period where their skills need to be improved and therefore deserve to be paid less? No, I don't think dessert has anything to do with it. I'm not, first of all, I think dessert is an impossible thing to decide. Who deserves what? Nobody deserves anything. Thank God we don't get what we deserve. <laughs> But, but I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying a very different thing. I'm saying that the actual effect of requiring equal pay for equal work will be to harm women. If women's skills are higher than men's in a particular job and are recognized to be higher, the law does no good. Because then they will be able to compete away and to get the same income. If their skills are less for whatever reason, maybe it isn't because they're saying it's their sex, maybe it's because they were out of the labor force. Maybe it's for other reasons. And you say, the only way you can you are able to hire them is by paying the same wage, then you're denying them the only weapon they have to fight with. If the unwillingness of the men to hire them is because the men are sexist, uh, are, 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 what's the phrase, racist, uh, sexist pigs or whatever, if that's the only reason they want to hire them, nonetheless. You want to make it costly to them to exercise their purchase. If you say to them, hmm, you have to pay the same wage no matter whether you pay higher women or men. And here's Mr. Sexist Pig. It doesn't cost them anything to hire men instead of women. However, if the women are free to compete and to say, well, now look, I'll offer my work for less, then he can only hire men if he bears a cost. If the women are really good as a man, as good as a man, then he's paying a price for discrimination. And what you are doing, not intentionally, but by misunderstanding. When you try to get equal pay for equal work, this is what you are doing, is reducing the city, the cost imposed on people who are, who are discriminating for irrelevant reasons. And I would like to see a cost imposed on you. I'm on your side, but you're not. Okay, <clears throat> give me a minute to reflect on that one. deserves anything. What about this penalty for bad behavior? So the one I wanted to focus in on is, is how do 
does the sexist pig get penalized in the market for being a sexist pig without the government pointing out that he's a sexist pig? Huh? Let me go, Marcus. Give him a shot here. What do you think? How does he pen how does he get penalized? So you got a, a female and a male, and they're both equally skilled, right? They're both equally skilled. How does he get penalized? All right, all right, David. Yeah, he has to pay more for the male workers than the female workers, right? So if a male worker, because of um, sexism or whatever, is 30,000 a year, so this is for the male, and the female is 30,000 a year, then being sexist and only hiring males means that it's costing you 10,000 bucks a year to be sexist. That's what he's claiming there. Right, so that's the market mechanism. You know, is sexism going to disappear by the government saying it's not lawful to be sexist? No, I mean, it's, these people, the bad behavior is still gonna be around. We kind of saw that with the licensing and the other things. Um, you know, back in the 30s, uh, what was prohibition? No drinking. Not only sell alcohol, but also the drinking, right? So. Basically, alcohol was prohibited. Did that eliminate drinking? No, right? So um, kind of it's, it's in a lot of ways foolish to think that we can make laws to kind of force this behavior away. And so what Friedman's saying is that in a way, it'll correct itself. You guys remember my Jackie Robinson story from yesterday? What was the thing that helped bring Jackie to the team? He was a good ball player. And what color did the owner see? Green. Green, right? And so it's kind of a similar thing, right? You've got Jackie Robinson sitting on the sidelines, one of the greatest baseball players of all time. And so the motivation for Green did that. Well, the same thing happens here in a competitive marketplace. So think about what happens to the sexist pig in a competitive market. If you have all males and your competitor has a con some combination of males and females, who's able to operate at a lower cost? The second one, right? So the, the non-sexist or the one who's hiring both. So if they can operate at a lower cost, how can they price their product relative to their sexist pig competitor? Lower or higher? Lower, right? Lower. And so now we're really digging into the bottom line and ultimately, if it's a really competitive market, will this guy eventually be forced to hire women? Potentially, or if he's really a sexist pig, he goes out of business, he's bankrupt. We just bankrupt the sexist pig. And so the market has a way of working itself out through profit maximization, the capitalist system can help squeeze the gaps and help eliminate some of that all on its own. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, um, last thing to wrap up some of the gender stuff. So this is from your book again. Um, here, we've got women as a percent of people earning selected professional degrees. So look at how things have changed over time. <coughs> These are all high paying jobs or low paying jobs? High paying jobs, mostly male dominated back in the 70s, kind of what we were talking about. But as we were talking about yesterday, look at the 80s, we started to have more people educated in these professional degrees and the earnings. And then today, we've had all of these, are they across the board? I didn't even look that closely. This one's close in business, which I think tells another interesting story. So across the board, right? Across the board, they're all higher. Which one's the smallest gain? Business. Why 
would that be? Now look at look at what happened here though. Which was one of the biggest gains from 70 to 80? It was right right up there, right? They're all kind of close, but these uh, 9 to 40, 7 to 50. So business was right up there, right? And then business has stayed about the same. Maybe it's that argument, right? Business closed the gap quicker. So the market mechanism of the whole green argument I was just making, uh, maybe that's what closed the gap quicker. And we kind of see that a little bit in the data. OK. Um, one more here. And then we'll move on to our next topic. So women as a percent of people graduating college. So what's the percent of females in the United States, roughly? Has anybody studied that or heard that in some other classes? I don't want you to Google it. What? What's your gut feeling? The percent of females in the United States, just male-female breakdown. I say like over at least like 54 percent. Would be female or male? Female. Female? 40. 40. It's about 50-50. Yeah, that's how it shakes out. And of course, now we have our, our gender issues that we deal with on uh, uh, who's a man and who's a woman. But that's a fairly small percentage, right? But who's born with a uh, vagina, who's born with a penis, that's about 50-50. Now, look at this data. What is that saying? Who's graduating college? Women. Women. So there's been a high, this has been kind of a change here since the 80s. There's been many more women graduating at a higher percent than men. So uh, in terms of the demographics, we're having a more highly educated women pop, woman population than males in the United States. So that's kind of an interesting term too. All of which again, I think long term is gonna lead to that gap closing more and more. Okay, questions or comments there? <laughs> All right, so our last chapter is income inequality. Income inequality. So is income inequality getting higher or lower, the gap between the rich and the poor? The gap between the rich and the poor. What have you heard in the news? Bigger or smaller? Bigger, right? So that's that's the claim that it, that it's bigger. And I'm just going to kind of tee you up with with my thoughts on it. If sometimes you guys want my personal opinion, I'm an economist. I just look at the data. But my opinion is, who cares? And I want you to think critically about that because most people care about the gap. But I don't actually care about the gap. I care about the poor. Do you guys care about the poor? So here's the thing. The gap is misleading. The gap is misleading. Because if we're really focused on helping the poor, it's what's the income of the poor doing over time. The gap could get bigger and the poor could get better. So what the perception is over time is that the income gap looks something like this, where this is the poor and this is the rich. And so the poor are getting hurt by the rich. This is not true, but that's the perception we get from it, right? When we hear about uh, the rich and the poor. Now, when we have a rich person selling something in the marketplace to a poor person, what did we learn way back from the first day of class? Who wins? The rich person wins and the poor person loses. So a free market exchange, a seller and a buyer, they get together and they do a trade, they do an exchange. Who wins, the rich or the poor? Somewhat a trick question. Javian, you're like, 
They both win. Yes, that's the whole point. They both win, right? We showed gains from trade from Tom and Jen on the island. So in a voluntary exchange system, they both win. Now, the winner's wins could be bigger than the loser's wins. That's kind of what the gap thing does. But the main part of the story is that they're both winning. So here's what the real data looks like um, in terms of over time, looking at uh, income of the rich versus the poor. Yes, the rich are getting richer, no doubt. But the poor are getting richer too. So here was the gap years ago, and here's the gap today. But are the poor better off? Yes, right? So as we go through a kind of a set of videos, I want you to keep that in mind and think about you know, what you're told by a lot of people is, oh, income inequality is bad, it's bad, it's bad. And I want you to be confident after going through this material to say, who cares? I want you to help educate other people on the reality of what that means. I hope I can convince you. By the way, if you don't agree with me, I, I don't mind that. Come push back on, push back. There might be some things I'm missing, but uh, so that, that's fine. That's what a healthy discussion is all about. But I want you to be able to pretty confidently say, this is what it looks like. And by the way, if you look at other countries, the gap sometimes does look like this, right? So in other countries where we have some corrupt governments or other things, then the poor could be getting made worse off. All right, so let's do our first video. The first video is going to be one that's similar. Let's see, I didn't have it keyed up here. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Or I could just plug in my laptop, but I think I'll just find it. So I want you to um, look at Income inequality in America. There we go. Okay, this is the one I wanted. So I'm just gonna tell you this video. My client's life isn't two dimensional, so I don't look at his portfolio that way. This video is the standard one. Oops, sorry, I didn't even realize you guys can see. Uh, this is from Time Magazine. You've heard of Time Magazine? So kind of most popular media. What the video I'm gonna show you here, this is kind of the standard thing you hear. So I do want you to take notes on it. I, don't, I think you're gonna hear something that you're used to hearing. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. I want you to think about all those points we're making because then I want you to take the normal. This is the normal, by the way. You are normal if you agree with kind of this video. I want you to be a little contrarian and be able to say, let's look at it this way and see if, I, see if we can make a difference. All right, so. Take notes on what they're saying and the details, the data, just, you know, just absorb it up. So here we go. Income inequality has always existed in the U.S., but the gap between rich and poor hasn't always been as wide as it is today. Let's take a look at how economic and political forces have changed the share of income held by the whole bottom 50% and just the top 1% of earners. The mid-century was a period of economic stability. The richest 1% earned 13% of all U.S. income, while the bottom half earned 20% of income. In the 1960s, Americans were still riding a post-war job boom. In the 70s, the lowest paid Americans got a boost from a steadily increasing minimum wage. Sky-high salaries weren't as typical as they are today. The 80s changed everything. Minimum wage stagnated. Factory jobs were automated or outsourced. Ronald Reagan passed huge tax cuts for the richest, and executive pay soared. By the mid-90s, the earnings of the top 1% surpassed everyone in the bottom half altogether. The rich were on a tear, and even financial crashes in the 2000s didn't slow them down. Today, the share of income claimed by those at the very top and those in the bottom half are completely reversed from what they were in the 60s. Countries don't have such a wide gap between rich and poor. Among economically developed nations, the U.S. is one of the most unequal, according to the Gini Index, which rates places based on how wealth is distributed. The higher the number, the more unequal the country is.
The top 1% in the U.S. is primarily made up of men. Women-dominated fields like teaching and waitressing are lower pay. Women are promoted less often than men. They make 82 cents for every dollar that men make. The top tier is also very white. Minority groups face systemic racism that has contributed to gaps in education, housing, and employment opportunities. African Americans make only 78 cents for every dollar white people make. Inequality varies across the U.S. because of regional economics. Large urban areas like New York City are more unequal because they have low-income residents as well as those in tech, finance, and other industries that offer sky-high wages. Whereas the Great Lakes region is more equal because the wage gap there isn't as wide. Race plays a role too. Southern states, which are generally more racially diverse, tend to be more unequal, while pockets of the West that are more white tend to be more equal. Upward social mobility is especially challenging for those at the very bottom. The rich tend to stay rich, and the poor tend to stay poor. So what could be done? Some legislators have proposed putting the brakes on runaway wealth by raising income taxes on top earners. Many states recently increased the minimum wage, and some states are closing education gaps by expanding access to early learning programs. But on a federal level, there's no consensus, and ultimately, closing the gap between rich and poor will require agreement from an increasingly partisan government, as well as societal shifts to combat sexism and racism. Change isn't around the corner, but understanding how we got here in the first place is a good first step. Okay, take a second to summarize some of your thoughts there with your notes. I'll load up the next one here. <clears throat> hey, so check it out. This is a emergency sleeping bag. These things normally cost thirty dollars, and during the winter, you know, another. Okay, let's see. What do we leave off with? Marcus back there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hold. Oh. What did you think about this one here? Okay, definitely gave the impression that goes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, good. Other comments? Did they point a little bit towards the system not working, right, at the beginning? So, in the old days, when it was the gap was smaller, minimum wage was increased to help the poor. And there was tax cuts for the rich that then caused a bigger gap and implicitly hurt the poor. They didn't necessarily say that, but that's a lot of times what's implied about this gap business is what we call a zero-sum mentality. If somebody wins, somebody else must have lost. But as we started off with in the first week of school, the market system creates two winners, right? So it's not a zero sum like flipping a coin and uh, Tyler and I have a bet and it's a $100 bet and we flip a coin, heads I win, tails he loses, right? So then I get the 100, I get his 100, my $100 win is his loss. That's not the market system. Right? That's the zero sum. The sum of the, of the wins is, is, what, is what does it. Okay, so um, other thoughts on this one, takeaways? Does the, the United States look like pretty bleak at this point, right? With this gap thing, the rich are getting richer. We're just on this path. And so what needs to be done towards the end of the video? Let's put those tax, uh, taxes back in here and then uh, increase the minimum wage, which, they, which, they, which they've uh, done in some places. So we need to somehow undo all of that. All right, so let's listen now to one of my favorite economists here. This is Thomas Sowell. And we're not gonna do the whole video on this one, but the first four or five minutes or so. Um, so let's listen to what Thomas Sowell has to say on this. Her economic myth is is one that you expose what? in, in the yeah we'll be right yeah uh, just we'll have a little reflection disparities that 
that all disparities, economic disparities in our economy, etc., are due to discrimination, that that's the sole course, and therefore they have to be addressed by economic policies. The most recent fad is, is reparations for slavery. How do you respond to that? Well, this is one of any number of one-factor explanations as to why everyone is, doesn't have the same outcome. A uh, hundred years ago, it was genetics. Uh, at other times and places, it was uh, exploitation. But again, these are ideas that sound plausible. But when you do it, research, you discover that everywhere you turn, there are a thousand reasons why people don't turn out the same. It goes right down to the family. Uh, in the first uh, chapter of this book, I point out that the firstborn uh, has higher IQs than his, his uh, siblings. And, and, and later life earned, has more achievements. Uh, among astronauts, for example, of the 29 astronauts in the Apollo program that put a man on the moon, 22 were either the firstborn or an only child. Now, if you can't get equality among people born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, why in the world would you think you're gonna get it among people who've had such different histories and cultures uh, around the world? And yet, you know, you continue to hear politicians using statistics, uh, sort of cherry picking statistics in order to form economic policies where the government gets directly involved. They, they always do it under the guise of social justice. Uh, it seems like anything that, that is, is led by the phrase social justice can be ex ex accepted by these people. Yes, and I guess one of the crucial assumptions of the social justice literature is that in the absence of, of bias, people would be, uh, would be similar. But they're not similar. You're, you're, they're not demographically similar. I mean, for example, the, the median age of uh, Jewish Americans, Mormons, Jap and, and Japanese Americans is around 50. There's no way they're going to be equally represented in proportion to their proportion of, of, of the society in the National Football League. I mean, 50-year-olds are, are not going to be able to compete with people in their 20s. Well, they seem to kind of break for, for sports teams, but, but uh, when it comes down to the general housing market, for example, that various policies have been specifically oriented towards the use of statistics to show that, uh, in fact, more black people are denied mortgages than white people, et cetera. I mean, they, they cherry pick statistics to try to push social policies where the government gets involved needlessly. Yes, well, that, that's one of the fallacies that I, I uh, show uh, up in, in, in my book that if you look at the uh, average uh, credit score of people of different ethnic backgrounds, you'll discover that the, uh, the, the order in which they, uh, they rank by credit score is also the order in which they rank by acceptance for the highest uh, quality uh, mortgages. Now, <laughs> that is whites, for example, uh, are turned down far more than Asian Americans. Why is, is this misused? Is it because uh, so often these statistics in order to force these economic policies that don't work? Is it because politicians uh, extend their term in office? Is it because of the, uh, the, the poverty industry, if you will, that, that uh, exists? What, what do you think motivates people to, to do these things that clearly are not benefiting our society or our economy? Well, these are things that are benefiting them. Politicians stay in office. Uh, by, by saying things that people want to hear uh, and by not accepting evidence that shows that they've gone wrong. You know, another thing that, that politicians love to throw out there is the wealth tax, is that there are too many wealthy people uh, that in order to redistribute income, we don't want to take away all wealthy people, we don't want to bring back the guillotine, but we need a wealth tax in order to cut into some of their riches. What do you think of that? Well, I think that's, that's one of the, the biggest fallacies because the most fundamental kind of wealth is human capital, which is inside people's heads, and you can't can't confiscate that. Any number of countries have forced people out of the country, they've expelled them or driven them out, uh, uh, and, and wouldn't let them take their wealth with them. And, the, and when they did that, did that in Uganda, for example, the Ugandan uh, economy collapsed. The Asians who arrived destitute in Britain, you know, within a number of years, they were prosperous again, whereas the Ugandan economy never recovered. You can't, if you can't confiscate the most fundamental wealth, it doesn't, the case for doing it means nothing if you can't do it. Professor. Okay, so we'll pause that one there.
Okay. And, and so what, did, what was he saying that the wealthy are able to do if there was a wealth tax? What can they do with their wealth? Yeah. Take it somewhere else. Take it somewhere else, right. So the, the wealthy are going to remain wealthy. Um, the, you know, if you go from 10 million down to 9 million, but even Thomas Sowell was making a, a even stronger argument saying that in the cases where the wealth uh, the wealthy fled and had to leave their wealth behind, which might be going on in the Ukraine a little bit right now, uh, to some degree. Um, they still have their human capital. What is meant by human capital? What they have in their brain. What they have in their brain, right. So the human capital, you guys are building up your human capital by getting your degree at Ottawa University. Then you're going to take your human capital and go to an employer and say, hey, pay me $40,000 uh, to do the work that you want me to do, right? So it's your skills, your attributes, all of that kind of, everything that's embodied in your mind is the idea of human capital. All right, um, I also thought it was interesting when he brought up the poverty industry. Um, what do you think he meant by that in the video, the poverty industry? That seems weird. Right? We talk about people that are down on their luck and they're in poverty and struggling to put diapers on the babies and stuff. What, what, what's the idea of the poverty industry? Yeah, Jackson? Possibly keep them poor or, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in that, that there's some sort of like devilish plan although it could be the devil himself, but the actual person, that there's some sort of evil scheme or something. I think if you don't have a good economics class like you guys are getting, then it seems like, yeah, raise minimum wage to help the poor. But what does raising the minimum wage cause? Inflation, Inflation possibly, but the bigger one is, I think I heard somebody say it, if you raise the minimum wage, what happens to unemployment right so we'll talk more about that when we get to macro class but we also talked about it here in the early chapters that it causes unemployment and so there's a lot of people who want to work at $15 an hour let's say we raised it to $15 an hour kind of ties us back into the uh, sexism and racism potentially so let's say the government raises it to $15 an hour does it cause unemployment yes so now we got a whole bunch of people that want to work at $15 an hour who is the, the few people who get the job, who get employed, if racism exists, if sexism exists, who gets hired? The whites, the males, right? The privileged group, whatever they are, they're the ones who get hired because there's no penalty any longer, right? The, the sexist pig and the racist employer now has Whites, blacks, Asians, women, uh, you know, the whole, everybody, there's a large unemployment, there's a large base, and so now at $15 an hour, they can pick the prefer, their preferred group, right? And there's no penalty like we were learning before. There's no, there's no payment or cost associated with it. All right, um, let's see here. Let's look at the data. So this is chapter 28, by the way. And this is one of the first, first graphs that we have in here that I did a little work on. So this is looking at the gap. So here is 1970 uh, to 20, the, the green one is 2018. And so the kind of the way we break this in, is into quintiles. So we take the whole population of the United States we order it from the lowest income to the highest income. And then we look at, well, what is the fraction of all income that the lowest 20% are making? And that's kind of what that first video did too. And then this is the top 20% of the population. 
the top 20% in terms of income, so these are the high income earners, you know, what is their fraction of all income in the United States, which is gross domestic product that we talked about earlier in the class that we'll learn more about, we'll get into more details on in, in macro. So it's the income of the United States. I kind of asked you guys last time to have a rough number off the top of your head. How much is the United States making if we add up everybody's income roughly? Is it in millions, billions, trillions, or gazillions? Trillions. So it's something trillion. What's something? Does anybody remember? Roughly. This is a good number for anybody, to, especially taking an economics class, to have kind of right off the top of your head. The income of the nation. Take a step. What's that, Mason? 20. 20. Boom. That's the number I was looking for. Good. Good guess. A little extra credit today for that. Thank you. Let's see, where's my extra credit sheet? I'll get that later. So 20 trillion dollars. So 20 trillion, again, we can't even really wrap our brains around it, right? That's kind of high, but this is saying that these folks here, the top 20%, have like half the income of the United States. In 1970, they had 40%. And in 1970, the lowest 20% had 5% of the income, the gross domestic product, the aggregate income of the nation, and the poor had, today, has 3.8%. So according to that data, is the gap getting bigger or smaller? Bigger, right? So we had 40 and now it's 49. We had 5.4. So this gap is smaller than this gap, right? So that's the income gap that we're all talking about. I'm not denying that. I just say, what do I say? Who cares? Who cares? Let's look at something real. Who cares about the damn gap, right? So let's look at something real. So let, now this kind of helps us out too, all right? Well, what do you mean, Dr. McCullough? Well, this one here shows a couple different things. So one is the impact of taxes and transfers. So when we take some of our distribution schemes, take from the rich, give to the poor, take from the employed, give to the unemployed, right? Some of our safety net stuff of transferring money, food stamps, welfare programs, all of that type of stuff. If we take that into account, that's what we're doing here uh, before and after. So the impacts of taxes and transfers on in 2016. So yes, it was 3.8, but now it's 7.7. .7. So this one comes down, take from the rich, give to the poor. Okay, you with me? So once we factor that in, that gap is smaller than what it was over here. Right, so that gap is a little misleading. I still don't care about the gap though, by the way. That's not even my main, main thing. So I went a little bit further, um, just so the, that you know the, the gap here was 14 times, so basically 3.8 times 14 equals 54, and the gap now after taking the transfers, seven times six is roughly the 47.6, right? So that's the, the gap being a little misleading after we take in the transfers. All right, but there's still a gap. There's still a gap. All right, so I did a little back of the notebook uh, calculations here for you guys. So, Real GDP in 1970 was 1 trillion. Now it's 20 trillion, right? So it went from 1 trillion to 20 trillion in terms of the income of the nation. Pretty good growth, right? I'm using real GDP that we'll learn in macro a little bit more, but what that means is that um, it's your actual purchasing power. So back in uh, 1970, I could buy a thousand McDonald's dollar menu hamburgers. Right, so a thousand, this is a, my income is a thousand hamburgers, and here I've got 20,000 hamburgers. Right, so my real stuff I can put into my shopping cart has gone up. It's not just because of inflation, right? So we've adjusted, what that means is we've adjusted for inflation, that the McDonald's cheeseburger was only 10 cents in 1970, and now it's a buck. We've filtered that out. We're saying how much, how many hamburgers could your money actually buy? when we look at this real GDP. All right, so now, 
If I look at the bottom share in 1970, they had 5.4%, but 5.4% of what share, right? The income for the nation was one trillion bucks, which gave them $57 billion for their share of the national income. Am I, are you with me so far? And here in 2018, the bottom half, the 3.8 of 20 trillion is 783 billion. So they're getting more money, but what's happened to population over time? Has it gotten bigger or smaller? Bigger. So just because we got more, if the population grew more, we could still be in a worse position. So I took that into account. What was the population in 1970? 205 million people. The bottom 20% or 20% of the population was 41 million people. Are you with me? Then I got 327 million as the number on our island currently, right? 327 million, at least in 2018, times 20% is 65 million people. So indeed, there has been population growth that would need to be factored in. All right, so if we've got 65 million people, how, many, how much money is that per person? So if I take the uh, 57 divided by the 41 million, then I've got $1,412 per poor person, right? You with me? So the income of the poorest that's in this section here was eating 1,400 hamburgers. So that was the for income back in 1970 of the bottom 20%. Well, what is it today? The 65 million people today are sharing the 783 billion, which means that each person is now consuming 12,000 hamburgers. Is that an improvement in life for material things? Are the poor better off? With 1,400 hamburgers they could buy with their income back in 1970, now they can buy 12,000 hamburgers. Are they better off? Tenfold. So the gap has increased. We can't dispute that. But I don't care. Because part of what's going on with the gap helps fuel the betterment of the poor tenfold. Some other stuff that we'll get into macro class is that if we do the same type of analysis in other countries where the gap is less, but they haven't seen the growth in income, they have gone up by two. Maybe they've doubled from 1,000 hamburgers to 2,000 hamburgers. It stayed pretty flat. So the growth from having a bigger gap has dramatically helped the poor. So when tell, someone tells me they're worried about income inequality, I say, I don't care. Who cares? And here's why, right? It does take a higher level of understanding to get through all this, right? There's no doubt about that. That's why it's easier to just complain about the gap. Oh, woe is us, the poor are poor, the rich are poor, the rich are taken from the poor. That's a lot easier talking point for this person right here, right? A lot easier talking point than working through the nation on what you guys just saw here. All right, we've got one last video to wrap up. If you're wanting to make a side income or you want to replace and your money, if you want to make a side income, money don't control, listen to these videos the without checking with me first. Sometimes they might be all right. There's been a lot said and a lot written about income inequality, about how unfair it is that a few people oh, are very sorry, rich and the rest of us aren't, that the income gap between the wealth said and a lot written about income inequality, about how unfair it is that a few people are very rich and the rest of us aren't that the income gap between the wealthy and even the middle class, alone the poor, is so large. There's only one problem with this complaint. It's wrong. 
Income inequality is actually a good thing when it's the product of a free market economy. And your own life proves it. An economy is made up of millions of individuals making decisions about their own lives, where and how much they want to work, what they want to buy, and so on. You are one of those individuals. In a country like the United States, you are free to pursue a path in life that you believe best suits your talents. That talent might be teaching, or making music, or banking, or starting a small business, or raising a family. Whatever it is, this freedom helps to make life enjoyable, exciting, and meaningful. But it's also an expression of inequality. This is simply because we're all different. We have different talents, different temperaments, different ambitions. That's okay because, again, in a free society, we can seek out opportunities that play to our personal strengths, that distinguish us from others. If you find what you're really good at and work hard, you might have great success and make a lot of money. If you're an outstanding athlete, I'll buy a ticket to see you play. If you're a savvy investor, I'll give you some of my money to invest. As long as you have the freedom to guide your own destiny, you have a chance to reach your full potential achieving success however you define it. But if someone, say a government bureaucrat, told you that your ambition had limits, there was a ceiling above which you could not rise, I doubt you'd be happy about it. You'd feel like you're in a straitjacket. Forced equality means less opportunity to pursue what makes you individually great. But what about the growing gap between the rich, the 1%, and the rest of us, the 99% that one hears so much about. Isn't that a bad thing? Again, the answer is no. Here's why. In a free market economy, people become wealthy, making what the rich enjoy today into something almost everybody can enjoy tomorrow. The rich are the test buyers. Consider the cell phone. Now we all have them, but when Motorola manufactured the first one in 1983, it was the size of a brick, had a half hour of battery life. Reception was terrible, and calls were very expensive. It cost $4,000. If no one had bought that $4,000 brick, there wouldn't be a $40 cell phone today. In the 1960s, a computer cost over a million dollars. Nowadays, thanks to billionaires like Michael Dell, we have incredibly advanced computers that cost us a few hundred dollars. Remember what an out-of-reach luxury flat-screen TVs once were? Only the rich can afford them. Today, your living room is essentially your own private cinema. The free market is about turning scarcity into abundance. What was once available to the few is now available to the many. Wealth and equality is an important corollary to that truth. So, should I resent the people who became wealthy because they have more money than I do? Or should I be grateful for the economic system that allows them to enrich my life and the lives of millions of other people? This feature of the free market, income inequality, can appear terribly unfair. But with a little further investigation, the real picture becomes clear. Income inequality makes what once seemed like impossible luxuries available to almost everyone. It provides the incentive for creative people to gamble on new ideas. It promotes personal freedom and rewards hard work, talent, and achievement. In sum, income inequality signals that individual liberty, opportunity, and innovation are all present in a free economy. Pretty good for something that's supposed to be so bad. Two final points. The 1% Club is always open to new members. And you don't have to be in the top 1% to have a very good life. And that, the existence of the very wealthy, is what matters most. I'm John Tandy, editor of Real Clear Markets for Prager. All right, so wrap up your final thoughts there, class dismissed. You can turn in those sheets up front. Make sure your first name, last name's on there.